Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Solace, and with me, as always, is my very, very talented friend, who is definitely a mastermind who's out to change the world, the Mixtress DC Gina. <laughs> Hi, Louise. Hi. You changing the world today, mastermind? I'm recovering from the world today. I um, <laughs> did my first cocktail competition judging yesterday, and that was... In a little different and insane and fun. It was live and vibrant. So I'm very hopeful that the COVID world is coming to a um, to an end. To an end. Yeah, that's so. awesome. Well, I'm glad. I'm hope you had a good time. Maybe yeah, not so too if much. I fall fun, asleep. I, I apologize. I'm just kidding. <laughs> How could I ever with our guest today? All right, go ahead. All right, here we go. So Gina, we're both creative people. Yes. Yes. And we all have our own creative ways. But I'm going to assume when you're creating your next master cocktail menu or thinking of your next amazing restaurant concept, you're probably not following in the footsteps of Steve Jobs. And Uh, here's why. No. Okay. Well, there's a good reason why. So obviously, he's one of our generation's most creative geniuses. That goes without saying. But did you know, according to his authorized biography, which was written by Walter um, Isaacson, when Steve, good old Steve, needed to concentrate on a few things, maybe the next newfangled piece of technology that was going to change the world, he often did it in the John or the Lou, if you will. I'm not going to say that's incredibly, you know, odd or out of the ordinary, but here's where it gets a little strange. Apparently he had a very odd ritual. He would sit on the back of the commode and dangle his feet in the water. Yes, he would soak his feet in the company toilets. I'm speechless, so. It's so strange. I have, there's no explanation for it. We can't even, and we can't ask him. I wonder if, what would Siri say? I wonder if we asked Siri. (laughs) Do you think she'd have the answer as to why? I don't know. (laughs) But this is an insane tie-in, so I can't wait to see how we're going to get there. So get me there. All this talk about creative geniuses brings me to today's designated drinker. She is a beverage consultant at The Cocktail Guru. She is the amazing Pam Whit. Wisnitzer. Maybe I got it. Did I get it, Pam? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's close? exactly phonetic. <laughs> so like if you just look at it, I think it's the two Zs always get people like really crazed for some reason, but it really is phonetic. Like yes. it's just chopped yes. up into three syllables, like Wisnitzer. Yes. It actually isn't difficult when you do that. It's just, I get so nervous and I screw up John Smith's oh name God. for God's sakes. <laughs> Don't even worry. Like the person who botched our name the worst ever on live television was Larry King, may rest in peace. And it was like really gnarly my dad was on there and he was like <laughs> it was so funny <laughs> it was really really funny I was like I've seen, I've heard it all so don't even worry about it I'm sure um, my last name is throws people and I always just assume that I've been called worse <laughs> I, I'm sorry Church of is so plain I'm sure that I never had any of those problems oh yeah <laughs> anyway speaking of last names let's let's get so. to know Pam Yes, Pam, tell us, how did your journey start? How did you become a guru? <laughs> Look, I still don't know if I am a guru. Um, but uh, it was a warm day in uh, May of 2000. No, I'm not going to go there. But basically, I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> I started bartending in college to make extra money on the side, just like for fun, because my friends were teaching at the Columbia Bartending Agency. At, uh, I went to school at Barnard. And they were like, come come drink with us on Thursdays, like come take class. It costs $120 for like this five week course. At the end, if you place in the top 20%, you got to be in the agency and they're like, come to class because we teach it. And then afterwards we'll wheel all the booze to the back room and we'll drink for free before going out on Thursday nights. And I was like, nice. yeah. I mean, that's, I was like easy pregame. Right. Yeah. So I ended up out of like over a hundred people in the class. I like t- made the top like five slots, I don't know, in the tests and everything. And so I just started bartending for fun. Like I didn't think anything of it, you know? Um, and then when the recession hit, like a few years after college and I lost my job because it happens, recession baby. Yes. Um, I just started, Unfortunately. Yeah, but fortunately, you know? So um, I, hated, sure. I hated my job. But I started daytime bartending at a sports bar in Murray Hill. For those who are listening who don't understand New York City, geography and I feel like Gina's laughing a lot right now but Murray Hill's like 
this area where it's full of bros who just got out of college and more bros and more bros. Um, <laughs> so I was at like one of those daytime sports bars and they told me it would be a horrible shift. I said, okay. And I turned, I transformed it into something spectacular. I had a huge following. I met all these incredible people in the neighborhood. We were like next to like a cancer hospital and a lot of schools and um, construction sites. So it was this really incredible intersection of individuals. And I, I think that's where I found out that bartending really has nothing to do with the drinks. It has to do with the guests in front of you um, and creating safe spaces and places for people to have like really transformative experiences uh, where they can just get away from the world for a bit. And I was like, I can do this. I can facilitate this. And that's where it all happened. So you created like a little oasis. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what every bar is. Like I always tell people like, it, it, you know, we are fortunate to have spaces that we can walk into. You check your baggage at the door of whatever is happening in the world. And you have a little bit of um, a brief break from all of it, a little recess. And then once you leave, then you go back into the world. But that let your bar and let your restaurant be an escape, escapism. That's great. That's awesome. That's definitely how yeah. I use them. It's definitely that you just described me to a T. That's exactly because, you know, I'm, I'm not in your world. I, I mean, I bartended in college just to make a few dollars, but it wasn't my calling. Right. But I absolutely yeah. love walking. I when during this last year and a half. It was so hard for me because that is exactly how I view restaurants and bars. It's where I get to escape. I meet new people. I get I'm an extrovert, mm -hmm. extrovert. And you just serve up the people for me left and right. And you're right. It isn't necessarily about the drink because I will go to places on a repeat because I meet fun people and I'm drinking rosé that's meh. You know, it's not my, oh, I can't wait to have that rosé. It really is. I want to go hang out with those with the, the people who are there. Yeah. I think it's always a very unique intersection when you're looking forward to the food and beverage as much as you are to the time that's being there. And not saying that's a, um, a one-off situation. You can get that at a lot of places. I just feel like, especially in the pandemic, what we learned the most and I guess we could probably talk about this later, but um, is that we, we yearn for the hospitality and we yearn for the space. And like, we, I didn't care if I drank the same mojito at every bar. Yeah. Like that was totally fine. <laughs> that was totally fine by me. And that's what I saw. That's what I noticed, especially in New York is that everybody, not that they dumbed down drinks, but like we went back to just this idea of like a highball or, you know, an easy Tom Collins or something else. Like we didn't get intricate with our drinks. We got more innovative with the way that we gave the experience because we couldn't do it in the same capacity. True. So yeah. it wasn't, yeah. I always say like food and drink are merely vehicles to have a shared experience. It's my true philosophy. And, and I think that's, what's so neat is, um, you can, you can have that same meteor glass of rosé, but it'll taste different in so many different spaces. Absolutely. That's, um, I think it's a perfect segue into what you did for the pandemic. So we'll, we'll fast forward. Pam got really fucking good at making drinks and she won like every competition. I'm just going to tell her, right? <laughs> and then she went on to judge every competition and then she went around the world making cocktails. Um, and then you can talk about your brand job in a second. But what you did for our industry, friends, everything on the Instagram during, during the pandemic is the true testament of who you are as a bartender. She, um, and she'll go, and I want you to go into it a little bit, but I will just describe my first time seeing it. I've been following Pam forever on Instagram. And one day I, I open my Instagram and Pam is like literally in full um, garb for um, Hamilton and she's making a cocktail and she has on a coat. And I, and I kind of breezed through the other stuff. I was kind of like, oh, this is cute. But then when she had on the full Hamilton gear and was singing, and making the cocktail, and, and forgive me, Pam, it wasn't anything, right? It, what was the drink? I forget what it was. It was, it like was something a, simple. It was, <laughs> it was a play on a, a George, like a Washington apple shot, and like right, we all a shot. remember, we all remember the Washington apple shot. Like that stuff is a little gnarly. It was like Crown Royal, like an apple schnapps and cranberry juice. But like I, I made it a lot nicer, and I, you know, I turned it into a George Washington apple shot, which is obviously like very Hamilton themed. So, so this comes on and I, I literally, I think I DM'd her right after I saw it and I was like, I don't know what you're doing, but you have to be on the designated drinker show because this is insane. It was, it was amazing. And it is the experience because my family, 100%, who definitely doesn't know who Pam, you know, Pam was because my family was out in Long Island. Um, 
was now following Pam and like, oh, did you see what she did this week? Oh, it's so risque. Oh, it, and like, you gave life to the experience of what we do, right? You gave, you gave it back. Like you, it wasn't like, you know, one o'clock in the morning and you had to sing along with your bar guest, right? Cause like, that's something that definitely has happened where you're like, you know, you have the right crew and there's somebody doing, you know, you have a shot, I don't know, you're drinking, you're having a good time and you're singing with your friends or you're dancing or you're in Brooklyn or you're on the train, but you gave them that. So can, can we just like talk about it a little bit about why, like what, where was the epiphany to do this? I'm like flabbergasted right now. Um, <laughs> okay, I guess for those who are listening, uh, on my Instagram, and they're pretty much like all in one row, on like, you know, the three cells, that's like in one row. Um, so it was the beginning of the pandemic, and I was like, okay, I was just trying to be like really, like really proactive. I, I think a lot of people, it hit them really, like the, you know, pandemic depression hit a lot of people hard in the beginning, and I was like, no, let's just go. Let's just like find the space and let's do something with it. And um, I tried to get really creative as I could and keep really upbeat. Um, there is a company called Broadway Roulette, which is an all women founded tech company that you like put in like $59 and the day you want to see a show and then like it just spins a wheel on the day of your show, it like spits out a ticket for you. It's a really incredible concept if you like want to see theater at a better price and maybe you, you just love theater to see anything. So they were only around for about like a year, year and a half. I always like talked to them about maybe doing something cocktail -y. And I reached out to them just to see how they're doing. Broadway shut down. The tech world's really hard. And they're like, this is a really hard time. We have no way to generate content right now. And I was like, do you want me to make a cocktail for you? Like something Broadway inspired? And they're like, oh, that would be a fun collaboration. And then I thought, I was like, okay. Like I could just take a picture of a drink and say, this is like a Phantom of the Opera cocktail, right? Like that's cool. And I started thinking a lot about, I started thinking a lot about the videos that are out there on YouTube and what people put out. And I've always said, people are like, why don't you have a show? Why don't you do a show? And I said, no one needs to learn how to make another old fashioned. It is so boring. Like, don't put out another YouTube video unless you're going to do something. And I think that's when it clicked. And I was like, oh, what if I just made a cocktail in the style of a Broadway show, like a little like parody variety? And that's what I did. And the first one was with Chicago and I made a classic martini. And I just like dressed up as like someone from the show Chicago. I, I learned the Fosse moves. I like made the cocktail while I was like <laughs> lip syncing the song. And it was really, I just did it for fun for Broadway Roulette. But I was really blown away by the response. And then what I saw, what I saw was that people like, I could see that they were laughing for like the first time during this hard time. And I was like, yeah, like I love making people laugh. I love making people happy. So I just was like, Okay, so Broadway Roulette people were like, can you do another? And I was like, yeah, I'll do a Hamilton one. So then I did a Hamilton one. And I was like, wait, maybe they don't have to be all musical themes. So then I did a Sia Chandelier one. And I did like a Miley Cyrus Wrecking Ball one. And I, I just wanted to bring to life drinks in a way that you could not only learn, but you could laugh, be entertained, and just not take it seriously, but still make a really epically balanced, beautiful drink. And I think that's where it came about. And um, I really just did it. I really just did it to keep everyone happy, and then eventually to also start incorporating really talented people to collaborate with and to give platform to those people, so they were also seen. Because um, there are so so many great people doing so many great things. So, and that's it. I don't do them as much now. I like still try to keep up a bit, but it's hard with my schedule as things open up. But it's. I think I made like 35 videos or something. Wow. This year. Wow. They take a long time. Yeah, they do. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Every week we were like waiting for the videos. I mean, legitimately. But I have to say, and I'm sorry, Louise, I didn't mean to cut you off. But I have to say like, that had to have been to see that response, Pam, how many people from around the world literally waited for that. And, and I, you know, looking and just scrolling through comments, that's so amazing how you like reconnected with all your people and then those people's people and then like really like made light of a very hard situation. So I, I think if someone ever, like whenever anybody asks like, what do you think like the best people were that were doing stuff during COVID for others? And yeah, there was people that did a lot of things in hospitals and food and, you know, we donated a lot of food and stuff like that, but like that mm -hmm. was the best relief. And I always point people in that direction. So thank you. I'm saying thank you for that.
No, thanks. All right, Louise, go ahead. Be serious. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Do, do, do the so interview. It, wasn't be, all right. it was the fact that it was bringing showmanship, um, you know, like back to into the, your space again. That's part of um, that. I think that's what makes bartenders great. Like I, you can have somebody who can craft an amazing cocktail. Absolutely. There, there's a science to it. But I think what makes a great bartender is you, of course, you have that. But then you just have that overwhelming, like, I need to be a showman and a great host and in a positive way. Yeah. And that you bring yeah. this to your point. It's an experience that and you you brought that through Instagram, which they were there. I, I think you're using the platform for a really good cause and good. And it's not just like, look at me, look at me. But it made fun. And yeah. that's great. That's awesome. When you can bring joy it, through it fun. a a digital space that's amazing yeah it is fun I just um I feel and I feel like Gina could definitely relate um there are parts of our industry and when I say industry let's get really real like there's like an inner like one percent that like has a lot of pop and circumstance when our industry is actually like over especially bartenders 650,000 people wow. strong in the United States yeah and then like you know millions more when it comes to hospitality in general um and I just think we all get really caught up on like looking a certain way, presenting a certain way, um, what's expected, afraid that people are going to make fun of you because there are like mean kids clubs still that exist, um, bullying. Um, like I got made fun of, like I full blown, like some parody websites, like tried to really poke fun of me. And like, I have a very, very thick skin. So like, I didn't care. Um, but I blasted it back at them. And I was like, good to see that you're using your platform, you know, yeah. for positive. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm going to keep doing. Yep. And I think like there were moments people saw that and then it also, it kind of, I don't know, Gina can also agree. I think it shifted a lot of mentality of like, what do we actually care about and how do we treat each other? And I saw a lot of shifts in compassion this year. Um, so I think that, that that comes with it as well as giving space. I saw so many, I saw so many bartenders blossom into such creative spaces. And I think it took like seeing other people push that boundary, especially people who, well, they have to look a certain way all the time. And they're like, oh, if they can do it, I can do it. And I just saw so many more people evolving. And that to me was really, really exciting more than anything else. So I, I'm not, I would never dare say I'm a catalyst, um, but I really enjoy the fact that I at least could shatter a bit of a glass ceiling about insecurities of perception and get people to think think different and think bigger. I think that's where, um, and I'll use this word leadership, but people in our industry, in any industry you're in, and just people who, let's just say we were walking the planet. I think when we can break down some of those barriers that hold people back in finding greatness, whatever it is, we're all just contributing to it. That is leadership. That is being somebody who is um, on the forefront. So thank you. Oh, thanks to everyone. Thanks. To, thanks to all of you. Yeah. Like Gina's like a force, like an inspiration, big one. Oh, um, I know it. Of us. I so. live it. She never lets me forget yeah. it. No. <laughs> yeah. Yo, please. <laughs> She's amazing. You know, Pam, I, I was just thinking as you're saying that, I'm wondering like, you know, what does happen now? The bars are open and like we're obviously in a uh, uh, hiring crisis because people aren't going to return to hospitality because it was... Uh, you know, no jobs for so long that people went on to school and I had bartenders that changed professions completely, yeah. went on to become, I have two plumber bartenders. I will never, I, I literally still can't get over it. They're like, yeah, I love being a plumber now. And I'm like, I'm like, you just did that all in one year. They're like, well, we worked for you and you, you would never let us call anybody. So it was kind of like the beginning of it. And I was like, like, no, I'm not that bad. They're like, no, you're like, plumbing's easy. All it is is valves and water. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. But they went on to do that. But I, I think about um, the, when you say safe space and stuff, you know, like, and this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but I really believe in this. It took a pandemic for people to realize that that was real. It took riots. It took it took so much that happened this last year and a half, now going on two years. And I feel like we are creating a new space. And I, and I think about like, so definitely some people from bartenders, especially you coming to mind all the time, about how do we conduct ourselves now going back? So, cause this will be a time in history where we'll be pre-COVID, post-COVID. And how do we change the bartending to really reflect that now in people's like attitudes of work and how they perceive themselves and, and health 
and, and mind wellness. And it's okay to like need to talk to somebody, a therapist. It's okay to not drink every day. It's okay to, you know, say, you know, have fun at work and also say no at the same time. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I keep thinking like, you know, I see all these books, like, you know, so many people wrote books during the pandemic. So many cocktail books came out and, um, I keep thinking like that, that book of wellness, that book of how do you do this? How do you come back to the industry? How do you, maybe you, maybe you wanted to come to the industry this whole time, but you were always afraid of this dark force. So I guess my question is, is that something you're thinking of? And like, is that, and I, and, and how do you do that? And like, and, and can we do that? Yeah. I mean, it's such it's a, a big, question. It's a big load. No, it's don't be sorry. It's a big loaded question. Um, I, I really love the hospitality industry. The, the potential in the hospitality industry is so immense and the way that it can be transformative and inclusive and intersectional is, is more so I think than any other industry, maybe in the world. Um, because in a lot of ways we aren't looking at your educational background. We aren't looking at, you know, how you grew up. We aren't looking at, there's so many things that we don't look at. We look at really the person who is arriving at our doorstep and saying, are you willing to step up? And um, I, I think especially something that's been really difficult for me is in the past past few years, I took a really big look at our at like our quote unquote industry, and this is talking food and beverage, and I was seeing like how much money was being thrown around and wasted um, at these festivals and at, like sending someone around the world. And I listen, I'm guilty of that. Like I'm very very guilty of it. Um, you know, being flown somewhere to like guest bartend or like you know to teach a class, and I'm like, what's the point? Like, what does it really boil down to? Like, what change? We're not, are we activating change? Are we just talking in circles and talking to the same 300 people, like in a huge echo chamber? Which we do, and it's the elitism part of the elitist part of this industry. Like, there's so many conferences that only certain people are invited to. You have to be invited, and like, then you're talked to. Like, what? That's such like bullshit. Like, what does that do? So. When some people have like said that they want to open up bars and restaurants, especially the past few years, my first question is I always look at them and I say, why? I say, why? Because if you don't have a why, if you just want to, then you're not doing it for the right reasons. And then wh why are you opening up in that area? Is there a particular reason you're in that neighborhood? It's just because it's cheap real estate or are you actively wanting to be part of a community? What we forgot is that bars and restaurants, like when maps were first created, for centuries and eons ago, what they always did when they always plotted on a map first was like the town tavern or food center. And then they drew maps around it because that was a focal point. That is where the town came together. It was a social place. It was a safe place. Like lots of business was conducted there. We have lost sight of that so hard as a society. Like we forget that like your local mom and pop restaurant or your local bar should be a place where you feel like you can go and say hi or if like you needed to use it during the daytime be like I have a group of moms who we need a meeting can we use your space and you should just be like yes because we're part of your community like and and I want us I know this is like a long-winded thing what I really want us to come back to is why we have these spaces what we are trying to teach people there are so many inherent skills in working in service that then apply to everything else in the world. You know when you meet another service industry person because of the level of compassion they have for other individuals when they're doing anything and the foresight that they have. It is, it is, it is unmatched. You look at someone, you're like, you worked in hospitality, what did you do? He's like, I was a pizza server. And I was like, I knew it. Like, you know it. And so I think that's what I want in this post-COVID times. I want us to strip away. I'm like so done with the ego. I'm like really done with the ego. I'm like done with the awards. Like they don't, like they don't mean anything, right? Like we, we use the term best all the time. And who's designating what best is? Best is subjective. Best is a subjective term that we use to apply to things that we like. Not that it's necessarily based upon parameters and, and lists and like check offs. Like who can even, who can even um, afford best, you know? So I think that's what I want. I want us to all look and see why we're a parts industry. If you want to actively contribute, be in a space where you're upholding one another, you get to work with a really diverse range of individuals, you promote within, you give guidance, safe places, try to pay like minimum wage on top, making sure people try to get healthcare involved like when you can. Um, 
and reset up an industry that failed for so long because we, it was just a tr it was seen as a transient space while people maybe wanted to try out other things but not have a full blown profession or career. And I I know that that's where in my career I want to be going is working to help transform that space more because the cocktail is cool, but a profession is cooler. <laughs> So now that you're back in New York and you're, you're in New York City and you're seeing that, you know, during the pandemic, we lost so many restaurants in, in Washington, D.C., but New York especially was a devastated market. And now that the reopening is happening and people are going back to work, but a lot of restaurants won't come back, do you think that in your market that it's going to give a better quality if, for not so much quantity, so, not so much variety or quantity of the same things over and over again, that it'll give you a better experience such as like a single restaurant do you know what i mean like do you know what i'm saying am i saying it wrong I'm saying so, it wrong some, we we did lose um a number of restaurants this past year and um i do think what will happen is what will happen is it'll make way for people who didn't have the opportunity to have a space to have a restaurant to potentially sign a lease on a space and open something because we were oversaturated. We already had too much. Like we were like, geez, more restaurants are opening. Like why do we need this? Um, and so since we lost a lot, it also gives space for those who maybe would never have access to finally have access to space. Um, I mean, that's the thing. New York City is very transformative. It, it continues to evolve. So even things that you love from like, you know, 20 years ago is great because you'll find something that came from five years ago that you love and something this year. It's like that is that is the beauty of New York. It's constantly an evolution. Um, but I've always said, I've, I've like said this like for the past like seven years or so, I always turn to people and I go, name me a restaurant that's open in the past five years that's going to be around for another 50 and like barely anybody can say that. Like that is that um, that idea, that notion of being able to have like a classic staple New York City restaurant and like a Keen Steakhouse, you know, uh, like Russ and Daughters. Like, yeah, Russ and Daughters. Like those days are over. Those days are really, really, really over. Like uh, now it's just sort of like a TikTok like game against your lease, your ten year lease. I always joked. <laughs> I always joke that I wanted to open a restaurant called 10 years. And instead of like celebrating your anniversary every year, it would just be like one year down off the lease. And then it was only a 10 year pop-up and that was it. And it never, never reopened. And I was thought that'd be such a phenomenal concept for a place to be like limited time. You know, it's like the 10 years. So like, you know, it's their one year anniversary. It's like nine years left. So. <laughs> do you think that'd be something that you would do after like go into your own space? No, it's, it depends. I, you know, there, there are some game plans I have down the line, but you know, if I'm going to go into a space, the, the idea has, I like, would hold a lot more intentionality. It'd be, it'd be much more than the idea of just a restaurant. I'm not here to just open a restaurant um, because I have no need to do that. I, I don't now, There are so many that why would I, but if that, it can do more than that, then I can do something great. Um, so perhaps a school. Yeah. So I mean, there's things toying with ideas. We'll see. We'll see. You know, game plans. <laughs> game plans. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. All right, Gina. I have a game plan. It includes yeah, I us feel like making a do. cocktail. <laughs> Let's do this. All right. All right. <clears throat> so this cocktail is, you know, I was uh, thinking about Pam, and I was like, I want to keep it simple, and I wanted it to be. Something that was just kind of reminded me of her, something really elegant, but yet playful. So we're making a frozen cocktail today. Yeah. So all the ingredients could be shaken into a cocktail and made really to be served up in a very chilled coupe glass. But much like my Pam, which I love, she always has a little bit of pizzazz. And I feel like making this a frozen drink for a hot summer um, or a tropical climate is you know, perfect. Kind of just kind of celebrates who Pam is, right? Thanks. So we're going to start up with two ounces of Hendrix Lunar. And we're going to pour that into our blender. And then we're going to add one ounce of Lule Rosé. And if you don't have Lule Rosé, you could use a different um, fortified um, aperitif. I can't get some bottle top to open. I mean, like worst case scenario, you can just use Rosé wine and be like, let's go. Yeah, put that in there. It's easy, totally easy. Yeah. Then you're gonna add, um, and this is a, this preference. You can add one, one ounce to half an ounce of sugar. You can delete a little bit if you want of simple syrup. Then we're gonna add one ounce of <clears throat> fresh squeezed lemon juice. We love that. And if you listen to the podcast, obviously fresh is best. 
It takes two seconds, put it in, it's, it's totally worth it. And then we're gonna talk about um, bitters. I'm asking for something floral in this cocktail and I leave this completely up to everybody. I'm using um, the Bitter Cube uh, Bovardier. It's got <gasps> a little bit of apricot in it. Uh, it's just really quite lovely. Wait, wait, I have to go grab my so. bitters. Wait, wait. See, it's always good when even the pros are like, wait, wait, hold on. So that's funny because I picked up the Bitter Cube Jamaican too because they have hibiscus in it. Um, yeah. And I was like, this would be so nice for this cocktail. <laughs> you know what's so funny, <laughs> Gina? So, I, so the other thing I do during the pandemic is I now teach a lot of online cocktail classes, like corporate classes via the platforms like Zoom or Google Meet. And I, yeah. I've to now taught, no joke, like probably over like five to 6,000 people what bitters are. Because people have no idea what bitters are. And so I have like a little lesson that I always teach. But I feel like there's this new army of people in the world who know what bitters are and can talk about it at like a wine and cheese party. And it makes me really happy. Um, you know, speaking of that, I did a, I did this one, I did a, I did a class for, uh, you know, during the pandemic and I'm like, Oh, you could just go to the city and go to the meadow. And then I found the meadow closed. In I New know. York and, I, and, I, and I cried a little bit. So for people, the meadow, you can still get it online. Um, the meadow was a salt store. Um, they had a location on the West Coast, and they had a location in New York City, and they sold chocolate, salt, and flowers. And every single time I came home, I stopped there because it was like I loved it. Anyway, all right, we have all our ingredients in the blender, and now this is my trick. I like to add one and a half, one and a quarter cup of ice to one and a half cups of ice for each cocktail. Okay. And that's usually enough to make it um, super. Uh, uh, chilled, and then you can actually get it out, and it's not gonna um, not freeze. So I'm gonna turn on my blender. Me too. Here we Ready? go. Wait, well, I'll see if I can go. figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! So one thing that love it. One thing you're looking for for like perfect, like a, a really good dilution for your frozen drinks is it shouldn't be too stiff. You should be able to pour your cocktail and it's coming out and it's got a little bit of uh, peaks and valleys and it's doing all the things it needs to do, but it's still a slush. Yeah. And that's a really nice, let me see. Yeah. Maybe mine's should be good. Yeah. Mine's doing just that. And I like mine. So love it. I, yeah. I like mine a little bit, always a teeny bit thinner just because. I get brain freezes really easily. So. Yeah, and I want to drink it. <laughs> so if you have at home some, you know, mint or something from your garden, something you stole from a neighbor's house and I'm not going to tell, throw it on top of there. Um, if you want to make it a little extra boozy, uh, a nice quarter ounce float of like a Fernet Branca would be really nice in here. Ooh, fun. Or um, something uh, a little minty, but honestly, it really doesn't need anything. Or you can add a little extra rosé if you'd like. Ooh, we love but, that. Uh, Oh, nice. Yeah, yes. I love that, right? Cheers. Absolutely. So cheers. We All right, this. ladies, cheers. As you can see, Gina, I chose not to blend today. I didn't read the instructions all the way through, so I was a little unprepared. I love frozen gin. I know it sounds ridiculous, but, like, I think I want to do, like, a frozen dirty martini. I don't know. I don't care. You should. I'm just going to say that I love this cocktail. This is really lovely and yeah. it's light. Um, tell tell our listeners, what is Lynette? Valet. Or Lillet, thank you. See, <laughs> don't say what I said. Say what Gina so said. Fortified, um, like aperitif. So basically, it starts out as wine, and then they add booze to it, and then a whole bunch of um, infused herbs, and and that's it's beautiful, it, right? So it just turns into yeah. That's the easiest way to describe it. Fortified wine. Yeah, and I always say it's um, it's kind of like a and pre bottled then, cocktail. It's like the OG pre bottled cocktail. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, you could definitely drink. So let me ask you Malay this: lay on ice with a lemon, is uh, like a squeeze of lemon is lovely. It's the best. Lovely. Let me ask you another. Um, since I got two pros, um, do I need to keep this in the refrigerator? Like yes. I would my vermouth. It actually says it on the bottle. Keep refrigerated. Okay. It should say it on your bottle. Okay. Well, doesn't it serve cold or it something? Just served served well. Yeah. It, it says served well chilled. Yeah. So I just wanted it so that. Oh yeah, on the back it says keep refrigerated yeah. after opening. So um, again, just so everyone knows, that's new. You don't want by that to go way. bad. Um, and like, and I love that you're asking this as, this, as I would say, like, the day walker that you are. Um, 
and it's my favorite. <laughs> and now I'm a day walker. I feel all bartenders became day walkers after post-pandemic. Um, no, no, you have to look at bartenders like the Harry Potters. Like we're still full bloods, but like we're amongst muggles. So like it doesn't matter if you're no longer practicing, you're still a wizard, you know? And sometimes we're like half bloods, we get it. Like I always say that I'm like, I'm like, oh my muggle friends. Because they're always still a bartender. I like that. I'll wear that. Yeah. Oh, well, I just assume that I hang around with Gina enough that kind of, you know, starting to uh, yeah. wear off. You would be, you would be me, what maybe. we call just a little bit of a genius because they're the people who like have the ends of the industry. Cause sometimes they're like children of industry professionals or like their best friends. So they know the lingo, they know ah. everything, but they're not, they haven't worked in it. Um, so they're half bloods. Gotcha. I love that. Go. I'm going to actually but, say that too. Uh, good. I'm, I like it. It's I'll fun. take it. That's really I'll take funny. it. Well, the, the truth is I did work in I did work in oh. the industry and I when you were talking about the fact that people way back though when you were talking about the fact that people you can always identify people who've worked in mm-hmm. the service industry I think everybody should work in the service industry because to your point it teaches compassion but service is really important and it just it's it's humbling is the wrong word because you're problem solving and somebody might just be having a terrible day and they're not really the person you want to see but you have to work through it and I think to your point, it feeds every other profession, the way you walk through life, the way you give back. I totally couldn't agree more with yeah. you when you said that. Yeah. So thanks. I, we'll see. Then you're a full blood. <laughs> I'm probably still a half, a half, yeah, I, I do. half blood, half breed. I've been a half breed all my life. <laughs> yeah. I do think it's important. Everybody at some point has the opportunity to work in the service industry because it really does change you. Um, and also like it, you can see when someone sits at a restaurant, the way that they interact with um, the staff. You can just tell immediately. Yep. <laughs> it with, yep. They're great. So Gina, get to your um, barkeeping. Where are they going to go to get this recipe? Uh, you're at designated show, and you can get the recipes, tips, tricks, and how tos. You can also get a link to where to find Pam, what she's been up to, what she's doing, and then maybe she's going to share with us what she has coming up, maybe soon. Um, and again, you go to the designated drinker dot show. Thank you, love. And then, of course, the, also you can also check out our uh, episode notes because all of those links will be there as well. Look at us doing our job, Gina, working it. I know. I'm proud of you. Is it time? I don't know. It's okay. time. It's time, Gina. So, Pam, I only get one question. It's at the end. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, as a person that gets to sit in the corner every day. So, Pam, and so in this world, <laughs> and this is how we know if you listen to the show or not. So in this day and age, everyone identifies themselves as some sort of um, animal or bug or spirit. And, and, and you might identify yourself as a red-bested robin because, you know, they're so regal and beautiful and they have flight and they can pick on things that are bad for, for um, people that are bullies or good birds to keep around to uh, keep the peace, <laughs> right? But if you can identify yourself as an ingredient... And it could be for cooking or for cocktails. What ingredient would you be and why? So I would be water. We don't think about water as an ingredient, but when I talk about cocktails, like every cocktail, unless it's like one of those room temperature, no water added, because those are, those are weird. Um, but every cocktail is water because you need it. It's the most essential ingredient to any single cocktail recipe, whether it's in frozen form with ice, um, uh, whether it's like in liquid form, whether you're like when you're evaporating, even like spirits to distill them and there's vapor essence in there, you know, the water is a crucial part of spirits in general and water is life. We're made up of so much water in our bodies. Um, and I like, I enjoy it because I find water not to be ever the main star, but it's the most essential. And that's where I like to be in my life. I don't need to be the main star, but I really like to be the backbone and be there in every capacity that I can for every situation. Um, but I don't need to be like the main ingredient that we talk about in the cocktail recipe. It's barely ever mentioned. It's just like shake with ice and it's okay because to make sure others shine is way more important. So water. Oh, I love that. Nobody has That's ever awesome. said that water. Be- so good. <laughs> love that. All right. Well, Perfect. on that note, I'm very <laughs> sad. I wish we had like a 10 part episode and you were going to do like a little dance, but <laughs> Thank you for coming, and Thank we'll catch you. up with you. This is such an honor. And, and thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. No, thanks yeah. for being Cheers. on. Cheers. All right, ladies, have a wonderful day. Try to stay cool. Cheers. 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 The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. 
Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.